it is clear that, that this city and this region is becoming denser and denser. Up until now, the city has looked to just push its, its boundaries further and further out to build more and more single family houses. And that was a part of our identity. That was a part of our psychology. But when that perimeter, that boundary, potentially gets reached. And you, you have to begin to look back to the city to build again and to build greater and greater density. How do you transform? And I think the challenge then can be even greater here in many ways than it is in other cities where you have a longer history of multifamily, vertical housing, you know, apartment towers. Um, LA doesn't really have that history, and to the extent that we do have it, it's been very politically controversial. The history of public housing here and being tied up in McCarthyism is, you know, it's not a very proud history. And so um, we have to move away from our, I think our, our focus on this, this single family ho house as the, as the kind of basic DNA, architectural DNA of the city, the basic building block of the city. One of the ways that I think the work as architects that we do can begin to experiment with that is to look at density not by importing models from more traditional cities, but to try to invent density, to try to invent a communal living on our own terms. What we are looking for uh, is exactly the right balance by uh, finding a way to produce great density for uh, the community, uh, to allow for the space of the individual, uh, but to also provide for opportunities for the building to connect in realistic ways through retail spaces, through outdoor community functions, through shared landscape functions that will, I believe, weave the life of of this new community more consequentially, more deeply into the ongoing life of the city that surrounds it. Anyone who's using a new building really has a sense of um, what message it sends about their place in society. And I think the really remarkable thing about these projects is that they signal, first and foremost, to the people who live in the buildings that, they, that there's a kind of respect for them built into the architecture. Typically, when people remark about the quality of our design, they don't always know that we're housing chronically homeless and homeless folks in them. And so um, there's a little puzzlement at first, but it, it, it is an entree to a larger conversation that these two things can coexist. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, you know, we believe that um, people who have been I'll just use the word designless in their experience being homeless, um, really need to have the best design places to live um, that give them the opportunities for things they did not have an opportunity to um, uh, engage in while they were homeless. To be homeless is to be uneasy. It can get very hectic and flustrating. This little thing's not, not being able to take a shower when you need to take a shower. It's uh, not having little things that we take for granted. I never thought in my life I would be homeless. <laughs> After, you know, I mean, you've been healthy, you know, you work. I've been working in the United States for 30 years, but after the year 2002, I got cancer. So I find out, you know, after that, I can't work anymore. And I couldn't believe I'm homeless. <laughs> Anytime you apply design to this kind of a social problem, there are always risks involved for, for uh, an organization like Skid Row Housing Trust because there's always a certain part of the population that will see any kind of design or architecture, especially architecture with a capital A, as wasteful. Um, as a kind of wasteful spending. And I think the line that Michael Maltzen has had to walk here, which is a really tricky one in many respects, um, is between being really efficient and making every dollar in the construction budget go as far as it can, and also bring some character 
to the building and also signal to the residents that the architect and the organization itself really cares about the quality of the space. I was ready to get my life in order and uh, I needed to uh, receive phone calls. I needed to take showers. I needed to have clean clothes on to go to interviews. And it was difficult to do that in shelters. And so uh, housing was a very important factor to me. Well, I prayed to God for two years to have the one place to sleep and take a shower and then cooking, you know. The one place to be safe. Outside with danger, I got raped twice. So in here, I feel like, you know, I'm more private. When I got housing, I still had issues. And, I, and, I, and, 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 and there was moments of despair, but there was a difference. The difference was, is that I didn't stay stuck. I wasn't stuck in flusteration. And because I had help. Housing helped me, and I wasn't willing to give that up for no crap, for no, or no or nothing that alcohol was going to bring me into. I did not stay stuck. I moved out of that situation. Where I'm at now, I'm working in a community center. People come in, and I help them with resources that they, that, that they may need in the community. You'd be surprised that the people don't know the starting point of how to get SRO housing, Skid Row housing and trust housing. They don't know that. They don't know the starting point. They don't know other housing that may be affordable to them, that may be uh, resourceful to them. They don't know where it's at. So housing, affordable housing, is an investment that we need in this country to help people right where they at. We really began to realize how we could organize space within a building that we were developing from the ground up to facilitate recovery from homelessness and the accompanying disabilities that people may, may have. Obviously, the uh, opportunity to create services offices for our medical partners, our mental health partners, um, but also opportunities for they themselves to become managers of their, of, of their own well-being. And we found that people really gravitated to the kinds of non-clinical activities to complement those clinical services. So we found the tremendous benefit that people got from outdoor space, gardening, uh, art, um, yoga. So we found that the more they were able to do that, less likely they were uh, to return to the streets because now they really did have something to live for. You're, you're putting together a group of individuals who are not, they're not a family or they're not a community by choice necessarily, but uh, in many ways by convenience. But many of the mechanisms that we are depending on in the architecture, creating courtyards, allowing there to be real visibility uh, within the space between individuals, to create and choreograph opportunities for people to see each other and to run into each other and, and be able to have impromptu uh, conversations. All of those are, are attempts to find ways to truly develop lasting, sustainable community in a city that hasn't, doesn't really have any models for how that has existed up until this time. I think the lesson of this kind of socially engaged work in architecture is that you have to try to strike that balance between um, efficiency projects that are really practical and durable, but also works that have enough architectural personality that they can be published, that they can have a life beyond just the building itself. For the homeless people, this play, that's a perfect play for us. And we can start, you know, uh, find a job or feel comfortable or look for a different way to live. You know, when you make money, you know, you don't care, you know, you think you later on, you make money, you buy a house, you buy... Now I know it's a value place. I think oftentimes people saw homelessness as an intractable problem, that I can't do anything about it, 
Um, so I'm not even going to worry about it anymore. And I think that we've shown uh, you can do something about it. Um, and it is, it does have a solution. Um, and it's up to us to figure out how they can be a part of it.